This is Toby Capwell, historian, author, and expert on medieval and renaissance arms and armor. Today, he's joining us to break down the armor from a selection of games, both historical and fantastical. Look at this armor, he's got gaps all over the place. You know, with a, a totally unprotected neck and head, open arms, sides of the chest exposed, it should be really easy to kill this guy. We've got more videos with Toby planned, so make sure to stay tuned and let us know in the comments what games or armor sets you'd like to see on the show, be they realistic, fantasy, sci-fi, or beyond. And of course, other experts will be making future appearances too. Of course. Mate, I've done that so many times, that's just so realistic. Not. <laughs> right, over to Toby. This is a little clunky looking, but it's basically giving you a vague outline, a vague impre impression of some kind of generic medieval knight. The helmet that he's wearing, it's, a, it's an okay rendition of a sort of 13th century Western European helm, but it's too small in proportion to his head and the body. One of the most central principles of armor design is the principle of layering that you don't just have one defense. You take different materials with different protective properties and you combine them together. So a helm like this is actually the, the outermost layer of a whole system where you have internal layers of padded textile, mail, and even a smaller helmet worn underneath. So in reality, this helm shouldn't be so skin tight. It should be a bit bigger on his head. And, and I'm not, I have no idea what's going on with his, around his throat. He's got these, this weird kind of um, row of oblong plates going around. I mean, what is that? There's, n there's no sort of recognizable precedent for what, what they think they're doing here. The, uh, the heraldry is okay. It's kind of nice to see that. The sun in splendor is a real heraldic image, although this one's a bit cartoony and a bit kind of Monty Python, so it, it kind of clashes with the rest of the image. It's kind of weird looking, but you know, it has some kind of medieval ancestor. All right, so this guy's armor is supposed to be made out of stone. However impressive that might seem, stone or rock of any sort is not really an appropriate material for armor. It's super, super brittle. If you hit this stuff, no matter how thick and heavy it is, it's just gonna shatter. There is one example I can think of, of stone armor that was made for, a, uh, for funerary use, burial use in China. But that's not even meant to be worn by anybody. That's just like a, you know, like a set dressing or a, you know, a funereal costume. This guy is carrying way more weight than he needs to. He's got all of these big plates sticking out and extending down way more than they should. And so he has a problem with weight efficiency. Again, if we're treating this as a real practical thing, with plate armor, you need to carry as much metal as you need to keep your body safe, but no more metal than is absolutely necessary. You have to justify every 200 grams that you put on your body. And if it doesn't need to be there, you get rid of it. And I don't care how cool it, you might think it looks, it shouldn't be there if it's, if it's inefficient. There's something weird with this armor. He's got this leather and mail thing where they want it to be plate armor, to look like rigid plates, but they also want the mail. And instead of figuring out how that should work, they've made semi-rigid leather plates and then put mail on them. And that's kind of missing the point of all of this. This is armor that won't be any good as plate and won't be any good as mail because it's not allowing those two materials to do what they're good at. You know, plates are rigid and smooth. They deflect things. They stop points. They glance. You cover a plate in mail like that, you're just, allow you're just losing all of that protective property. And the thing about mail is that it can be really closely fitted to the body. It's like metal fabric and you want it to be close fitting because it's, it's just to stop laceration. You know, the plate will do that anyway. That's not what this is for. This is again, purely about aesthetics and whoever's designed this isn't equipped to be thinking about function. His opponents have a lot, there's a lot more real medieval stuff going on there with like um, 
chains sewn to the sleeves of the coats and things. And they're all wearing helmets, you know? Why do the, why do the bad guys get to wear helmets but our hero isn't wearing a helmet? That seems like an oversight on his part. Oh, he's got an upgrade. The designers have looked at late 15th century armor, specifically German Gothic armor of the 1480s and 90s. There's some kind of reference going on here, but there are some major problems too. Again, first of all, doesn't matter how uh, impressive his full plate armor on his body is if he's not got a helmet. You might as well not wear the rest of it if you haven't got a helmet. And also, I think they're, they've rushed into the design of the exterior layer without thinking enough about what's supposed to be going on underneath. So this is an arming doublet. You know, this is what you wear under full plate armor like this. The armor will not work unless it's got the right undergarments underneath. And uh, I mean, although they seem to be aware in the design here that he's got some kind of fancy textile garment underneath, it's not doing its job. This isn't just a fancy thing to wear underneath. An arming doublet has arming points on it. It's a foundation garment. It's got the attachment points for the armor integrated into it. You attach the leg armor to it, you attach the shoulders, the arms, everything runs off a doublet like this. And we sh on this armor, we should see those attachment points. You know, again, the, the lack of the kind of mechanical authenticity is shown by the, how his shoulders are just kind of falling off of his body there. Generally, with a shoulder defense like this, I mean, what he's effectively doing here is he's wearing the armor with the shoulder undone. Whoever's put him in this armor didn't know what they were doing. You know, that should be down, protecting your whole shoulder right up, uh, a, you know, a, across to your, to your neck. And it's, it's gonna have a lace right there, which is tying it down to the arming doublet. So, you know, it's actually protecting you. And look at this armor, he's got gaps all over the place. You know, with a, a totally unprotected neck and head, open arms, sides of the chest exposed. It should be really easy to kill this guy. It just kind of degrades the character. A character like that should know how to wear armor and should probably be acquainted with the virtues of wearing helmet, neck protection, things like that. Ah, okay, Romans now. I mean, that's an interesting point about design straight away. As soon as you look at a character, you know what your frame of reference is. This guy says Roman immediately. So this, I think this is kind of interesting because it's a fantasy. No actual Roman ever looked like this, but it retains the sense of Roman. I mean, just about anybody can recognize this as Roman. And what's going on here is kind of interesting because they are using real Roman elements. There's reference to a lot of real stuff here, but they're combining it in a very improbable and fantasy way. The Romans had real mask helmets, especially in like the first and second centuries AD, but the mask helmets were generally worn for a kind of cavalry game, kind of javelin game. It's almost like a tournament where cavalry would gallop around and throw javelins at each other and there was a lot of fancy costume and stuff they wouldn't wear on the battlefield. And that's the context of these Rome, of these mask helmets. The, the crests are, you know, typical, of course, in the Roman period for marking out officers and commanders. The muscled breastplate is more of a ancient Greek thing that really predates the Romans. The Romans had them too. Roman officers sometimes wore muscled uh, cuirasses of bronze. So that's a Roman element. The, the pendant teruges, as they're called, these strips that hang down from the waist, you know, that's more or less a real Roman thing. But the, you know, the muscled cuirasses in the Roman period are an older thing, the mask helmets are a newer thing. So they're just taking things that they like and mashing them together to create a fantasy. But that's the kind of fantasy I like. I would rather the fantasy is based on something and someone's cracked a book and done some homework to develop the fantasy rather than just making stuff up off the top of your head. So now our Roman hero has encountered somebody who looks a little more sort of vaguely medieval. I guess we're allowed to combine the mixed periods and characters in this game. 
Generally, I really like seeing that a, a, a well-armored character is able to move vigorously and fight well. I mean, that's a nice thing to be able to see. Just because he's covered head to foot in metal doesn't mean that he has to be lumbering and slow. Good metal armor doesn't have to be that, that thick to give good protection. And the vigorous movement, to, you know, combined with the armor is nice to see. So you can do a lot more in armor than a lot of people think you can. One thing you can't do, though, as, as shown pretty categorically here, is swim in plate armor. Whatever the opposite of a life preserver is, it must be armor. With that much metal on your body, just as, as shown here, if you go in the water, you're not coming back up again. Okay, for a start, I mean, this looks a lot more like actual armor. I mean, someone has clearly done a fair amount of work to you know, engage with real armor, understand it, how is it put together, how do you wear it, and what does it look like when it's all put together. So I, I suspect the designers here have been looking at real stuff, but they've also been looking at reenactment. Like the, the knee plates are kind of oversized, and, and some of the ways it's put together is a, a weensy bit clunky. The vision slits and the visor are too wide, but I'm, I'm starting to really nitpick now, because overall this is the best thing we've seen so far. The martial arts form of these guys is really good too, actually. I know I'm not supposed to be talking about that, but the way they're moving has bearing on what equipment they are using as well. And we're getting a sense immediately that the armor that they're wearing is actually doing something. He got cut there and that hurt him, but he'd gotten hit a few other times earlier where the reactions were less severe. So they're thinking actually about armor as a practical thing that will benefit the character not just a cosmetic skin. You get a really nice sense in this and how the armor is a major obstacle and that you have to somehow get past the defenses that your opponent's wearing and it's laborious and difficult and a lot of the things that you try fail. Ah, bows, okay, this is good. Longbows against armor is like one of the all-time most misconceived aspects of medieval combat. No. no, but I mean, again, you're seeing what the armor does. You know, the strongest parts of the armor will stop arrows perfectly well. And hurting someone as well armored as this depends on luck, that lucky strike, or just the cumulative effect of lots of, of small wounds starting to add up. The, the different kinds of reactions here, that the reactions are geared to where he gets hit, how many times he's been hit. It, it's easy and very common to over-accentuate the blunt trauma aspect of war arrows. These things are not carrying a lot of inertia. They don't, there's really no such thing as significant blunt trauma when you're getting hit by arrows. But, you know, he ultimately got killed by a lucky shot through the sight, which is totally plausible. I mean, that is by a very long way the, the best thing we've seen so far. And I think it's probably going to stay the best thing we're going to see. So this is a fantasy game. It's a Japanese fantasy game, but it's, it's making a very specific historical reference here which I really like. Obviously the Japanese had their own knightly culture, the samurai, they had their own traditions of armored combat, their own armor technology that evolved totally independently of anything that's going on in Europe up until the arrival of, of Europeans in Japan. By the 16th century, European plate armor was being imported into Japan and the Japanese took some interest in it. There were some, some pieces they really liked. As you can see on our, our giant armored guy here, these, sort of, these helmets with these kind of uh, almond-shaped skulls with the, little, with the brim, that's called a cabaset. Very typical you know, European helmet of the second half of the 16th century. And he's also wearing a, a deeply pointed so-called kind of peas cod breastplate. And those are two elements that the Japanese were really taken with. And there's surviving Japanese armor that incorporates those European elements. The Japanese actually had a word for armor like this. 
that incorporated European pieces. They called it Nanban armor or barbarian armor, foreigner, barbarian, same thing. So that particular helmet and this particular type of breastplate and the overall kind of 16th, early 17th century look of this character is actually bang on for this very specific armor context. They, they never were interested in big European swords and they didn't really ever have a use for the articulated arm and leg defenses. They've added that as the kind of fantasy element. But there's some core reference here that, that I, I, I really appreciate. I mean, plate armor gives you really great protection, especially against cuts. I mean, this guy can cut with that sword all day long and he's never gonna get anywhere with someone wearing this kind of armor. You know, stabbing in the gaps is what he should have been doing more of all along. I mean, this is true though, you know, fighting vigorously in armor like that is tiring. And they seem to be taking that into account in this game. If the player can just keep him fighting and let him tire himself out, you'll have a better chance. And that's real. In a real situation, that wouldn't be a bad idea because you can't fight vigorously in 25 or 30 kilos of armor for very long. Even if you're a really fit, trained warrior, you still only got a couple of minutes of, of continuous action before you're gonna start slowing down and getting tired. Okay, here we go. Yeah, I hate this already. Yeah, this, there's all kinds of silliness, weird modern tropes happening here. Let's start with the most obvious thing, these, the horns on the helmet. There are some historical examples, very few, but there are some historical examples of horned helmets. But in all cases, there's some ancient Greek ones, there's some Celtic ones, they're always purely ceremonial. They're costumes for some kind of spectacle or festival or ceremony. They never intend to fight in horned helmets. The Japanese have them occasionally, but they're usually really lightly built and expected to get destroyed in the first contact with the enemy. Japanese writers actually said it's a glorious sight to see the crests of helmets destroyed in the first action of a battle or whatever. But, you know, pseudo-fantasy Viking guys like this swaggering around with horned helmets is just, is just silly. I mean, as a general rule, as a martial artist, it's a general rule that if you get control of your opponent's head, you win, or at least you have a serious advantage. So why are you putting handles on your head? You're doing an enormous service to anybody who comes to grips with you. And you know, this whole downturn thing, uh, people think it looks butch or whatever, it's stupid, stop it. So I presume at some point he gets an armor upgrade or something. Yeah, that, that's like one of those, there's heavy armor, there's light armor, that's the first heavy armor you get in the game. This is an armor upgrade, glass armor. I wouldn't have thought glass armor is a good idea. <laughs> it's really goofy looking. No, I don't don't like it at all. I'm sorry. It's goofy looking. Just a couple of quick comments on our heroine's get up here. There's a couple of pretty common modern misconceptions that are encapsulated in this character. The most basic one is leather clothes. I mean, throughout history, people of whatever culture, certainly in Europe, almost never made clothes out of leather. And yet it's somehow this modern idea that people in, the, in history wore biker gear. It happens in film, television, games, all over the place. I don't know where it came from, why people think that looks medieval but it, it doesn't. The other kind of weird thing about this character's look is that she's only wearing one piece of plate armor. And that's fine, but one elbow to the exclusion of anything else? I mean, generally when you wear armor, it's because you have some kind of priority. If you've got one piece of plate armor, you put it somewhere that really matters. And one elbow doesn't really get her anything. And she's a slinger. So she's actually starting to encumber a bit her, her slinging arm, which doesn't make a lot of sense and certainly doesn't excuse whatever protective benefit she might be getting out of this. Don't hurt him! 
You're not gonna put the child. I like the idea of an imposing, heavily armored opponent facing off against someone who's only got a sling. That's a kind of an interesting problem of weapon versus armor. But this individual's armor is just kind of weird and not obeying the laws of gravity and not actually designed particularly well. I mean, look at the leg armor, for example. This is not how you build leg armor. He's got these random individual plates just kind of magically stuck to places where they should just slip down. The strap around the back of the leg is not going to hold these pieces up. Good leg armor has to be an integrated assembly of pieces riveted together and then tied up at the hip to support it. And this is kind of Mandalorian style fantasy leg armor that quite apart from the physics of it, look at the gaps. I mean, what is the point in even wearing this when you can stab him just about anywhere you like and chances are you'll hurt him. Also, look at that. Look at his, his breastplate doesn't have really any shape at all. And it, the breastplate is actually overlapping the shoulder plates, which is exactly the reverse of what you want. Things that are moving have to be overlapping the things that aren't moving. And also look at this, his whole neck and throat are exposed. The neck and throat is one of the most dangerous, most vulnerable areas of the human body. So he's paying a huge price in, in, in the physical weight and, and the cost and encumbrance of wearing big plates like this. I mean, none of this armor is actually doing very much. And, and in the gameplay, it seems like you have to hit him with the sling and knock the pieces of armor off before you can hurt him. But you know, she would have no problem hurting this person and she doesn't need to make any of the plates disappear to do it. 1415, Northern France. The Hundred Years' War continues. So they are really closely defining the context here. This isn't some fantasy thing off in some, you know, vague period in some other history. This is 1415 in France, Battle of Agincourt. But when you're defining the historical context this specifically, then you've got a whole new pressure on your historical authenticity and in the quality of the design. And this is already just all over the place. They've blown it before they've even started. What we're seeing here is a, is a mixture of 13th, 14th, 15th, 16th century elements all mashed together. The shape of the banners and the, the heraldry is off. And just this idea of one army all wearing red and the other army all wearing blue. This is like the Middle Ages according to Playmobil. And actually, I think this might be an instance where the perceived requirements of the game and the gameplay are kind of interfering with their ability to create a good visual image. Like they've made certain assumptions about how the game needs to be played. Well, people aren't going to be able to tell what side is what. I, I would like to see historical authenticity given more of a chance before you chuck it out the window because you think it won't work for your game. Right, here he is in his, in his armor. <laughs> okay, uh, I mean, what are, you gonna, what are you gonna say about that? This is its own aesthetic. It's moving way pretty far out into the realm of something that doesn't have anything to do with our universe, really. Climbing in armor, you can actually do more of that than you might think. There's a lot, a lot of great depictions of knights climbing siege ladders and full plate armor, scaling walls. You need to be able to do that. So even in this fantasy realm, that's a nice thing to see. This is a little bit more vaguely historical sort of looking. I like the tail on the helmet there. He's wearing a sallet with a tail at the back. You know, tailed helmets are really good for keep, you know, protecting the back of your neck from things falling on you and stuff like that. You can see how it's protecting the back of his neck. That's why firefighters wear helmets like that. It's a very similar kind of um, design profile. Yeah, we're, we're starting to move well beyond my authority to comment, I think, here. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching. Remember to comment below what other games you'd like to see on the show. And of course, be sure to subscribe for more content like this and beyond.